Very excited about today's topic. I'm joined by two fabulous guests. I'm going to introduce them in a moment. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, how you can unlock the power of real zero trust. We hear a lot about zero trust in the marketplace. It's referred to in regards to applications, to your network, to the infrastructure, to users. We're here to tell you that you also need to think about zero trust when it comes to your content layer. Uh, both Kiteworks as well as Forcepoint have been talking about this topic for some time now, and we are bringing the two together. Uh, we have an expert from uh, Forcepoint, uh, Dan Turner, and then we have Amit Torn from the Kiteworks team who are our panelists, and they're going to be talking about you know, why this is an issue in the marketplace and how the two companies have come together to extend zero trust into the content layer for you using content-based risk policies. Uh, a few housekeeping items. We do have a number of experts from both the Kiteworks as well as the Forcepoint teams on the line with us today in the chat. If you have questions throughout today's conversation, you can chat those in. Uh, they will do their very best to answer your questions. If there's a topic that you pose that they can't answer, uh, we'll get back to you with uh, an answer after today's webinar. We also will attempt to cover some questions at the very end. We'll see if uh, we're at the top of the hour when we wrap up uh, our conversation. If we do, we can try to cover a few of the questions that come in that we think are particularly relevant. Uh, so with no further ado, uh, we'll jump into today's conversation. Oh, one other thing. Uh, we do have a couple links that may be of interest to our audience. Uh, there's a brief that we completed that, that talks about the joint solution between the Forcepoint CDR, the integration, and the KiteWorks private content network. You want to check that out. There'll be a link in the chat that Eric will be uh, placing uh, momentarily into the chat window. And then uh, we also have the joint press release that we sent out a few weeks ago that also contains uh, detail, has some uh, cool quotes from Meet and Dan included in it as well. So uh, I'm joined, as I noted, uh, by Dan Turner. He's the Vice President of Global Threat and Compliance Intelligence over at Force Point, as well as Amit Torn. He's our Senior Vice President of Corporate and Business Development at Kiteworks. Uh, Dan, let's start with you. Can you uh, talk a bit about your role? How long have you been at uh, Force Point? And uh, you know, uh, what about this uh, threat and compliance role that you have? Yeah, thanks, Patrick. And it's delightful to be uh, sharing a stage with both you and Amit today. It's a uh, it's a real privilege. So, so actually, a bit about my background. I actually joined Forcepoint in an acquisition. So at the time, nearly two years ago, I guess, Forcepoint were looking for a high assurance, high efficacy anti-malware engine. And the company that um, I was actually chief executive of had developed a capability that seemed to fit the bill. So the acquisition happened and we've never looked back. It's been a wonderful, wonderful, almost a marriage made in heaven for us. So we're really excited um, to bring the technology that uh, was acquired by Forcepoint that is known today as Zero Trust Content Disarm and Reconstruction, or for short, ZTCDR. So, so that's how I came to be into, into Forcepoint and, and took up this role, Patrick. Interesting. There's a whole different conversation about the transition from leading the company to having it acquired and then being an executive in the company that acquired you. Uh, well, we, we can add, add those questions at the end of the conversation, I guess, today, right? Yeah. Happy to. <laughs> Happy to, but it's worked well. Amit, uh, you're one of the first people I met when I came on board at KiteWorks, uh, what, 18, 19 months ago. Fascinating background. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, your role at KiteWorks and where you came from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, my role uh, is pretty diverse. I lead uh, strategic partnerships like the one with Forcepoint, but I also lead the uh, M&A activities, business analytics, pricing, and other uh, internal strategic initiatives. I'm with Kiteworks for two and a half years. It feels like it's just the beginning, though. I spent time with PwC before uh, leading business development and M&A advisory, uh, led business development for a small startup in Tel Aviv before. And uh, I started my career in the Israeli cybersecurity ecosystem, where I uh, firsthand uh, gained knowledge uh, and experience in nation state uh, uh, activities, I would say. So that became very useful for our focus here at uh, Kiteworks in cybersecurity. Yeah, and you can't talk anymore about uh, that first role, obviously. <laughs> not too much, not too much. <laughs> We'd get in a lot of trouble. All right, let's jump into what we're going to cover during today's uh, webinar. First of all, we're going to talk about the problem. You know, why is Forcepoint and KiteWorks coming together in this strategic partnership? 
Two, uh, as a result of that problem, there's significant financial risk that is posed to organizations that don't have the right security and compliance controls in place. We'll talk a little bit about you know, this, this uh, deep risk that's hidden that organizations don't necessarily know about. Uh, we'll delve into the details of what we mean and, and what Forceport means when we, we use uh, this term called content-defined zero trust. Then we'll uh, delve into some details in terms of how KiteWorks and Forcepoint uh, have integrated the solutions, specifically the CDR, the LPs on the roadmap, uh, into the KiteWorks private content network. What that looks like, we have some detailed slides uh, that are eye charts that I think all of you will find interesting. We spent a lot of time putting those together. Uh, cover some key takeaways, and then uh, if we have time, as I noted at the end of the conversation, we'll uh, cover a few questions that have come in uh, that the team probably is already answering as one-offs in uh, the chat right now. So what is the problem? Uh, let's overview what this looks like. Uh, at a high level, and this is based on a study that we conducted last year, and we're actually getting ready to conduct our 2023 study. The survey will be going out this weekend to 603. Don't ask me why 603. 603 uh, respondents in the IT and security risk management compliance space. So in about a month and a half, we'll actually have a webinar reporting some of those findings. But in last year's report that we conducted about a year ago, we found that two-thirds of organizations use four plus tools for content communications. And this includes, you know, file sharing and collaboration, email, managed file transfer, web forms. There's just a, a plethora of stuff that sets out there in silos that don't communicate with each other that creates a lot of different problems. And that's what we're going to delve into here. We actually have three. Uh, uh, we'd have a good sermon here. We're talking in uh, uh, segments of three. So the first one here, and I'll let uh, Amit delve into a little more detail on this topic, but not all content is meant for public consumption. And if it's actually exposed, it can create significant regulatory and compliance risks. So, I mean, there's a lot of sensitive content out there just, and it's burgeoning. If you look at all the different reports, it's like doubling every year. Uh, you can go to the moon and back or to Mars and back or you know, the analogies that are used. Uh, can you talk a bit about the different types of sensitive content and more where how it poses a risk if it is exposed from a regulatory or compliance standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there are many types of sensitive information, you know, financial information, healthcare and medical, HR, legal, sensitive IP, trade secrets, classified information from the government, and of course, uh, PII. Uh, and each and every one of those types have uh, regul regulations, compliance, laws, uh, in order to make sure that uh, the organizations do not share it uh, with uh, unauthorized people. And now if you don't comply, it's a huge risk. Uh, you could be uh, uh, prosecuted, you can have hefty fines, uh, you can even go, uh, go uh, so far as going against your officers in the company. Uh, the, the risk is huge. Uh, take example, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, T-Mobile uh, breach, for example, um, you know, hefty, hefty uh, uh, legal actions, uh, huge loss in uh, in uh, valuation. Yeah, and we're going to delve into those in a little more detail on a subsequent slide here. So we don't want to uh, uh, cover just everything on that topic because we're going to cover some stuff in greater detail that I think our audience will in appreciate the, the breakdown that we constructed there. Uh, but that's certainly a problem. So let's look at problem number two. And I'm going to have uh, Dan talk about, about this one. Untrusted external third parties, you know, that supply chain can inject malicious malware within content that when opened, uh, it can enter devices, the network, applications and systems and create just absolute havoc across the environment allows organization, you know, malicious actors to get access uh, to your content and they can move laterally across the network and so forth. Um, Dan, uh, you know, you founded a company based on this very problem. You know, what are some of the ways in which malicious actors can inject malware and what are the implications when it actually is opened? Yeah, so there's really two aspects to this. Firstly, files shared with you might contain code or scripts that run when you open them or even when you click inside them in some way. Attackers can get their code to run on your desktop, then you're in trouble, right? So once they can do that, they can generally work their way up to owning your whole machine and then get onto your network. And then you've got real problems there. So, but there's a kind of a second aspect to this that files can also 
be very carefully and well crafted to be corrupted by an attacker. So although they don't contain obvious code, the application will accidentally execute what should be passive data. So those are really the two key ways, Patrick, that you know the, those kind of um, actors inject malware to your system. Interesting. Now, the latter is particularly interesting. It's one of those issues where the attackers just get more and more sophisticated in terms of how they are gaining access to your data and your system. Right. Hmm. And then we have one more item here on this slide in defining the problem. Um, complexity of risk management increases exponentially when sensitive content, it, it's disaggregated, right? You have all these different silos like we just talked about, file sharing in one bucket, you have email in another bucket. You may even have multiple file sharing solutions. Uh, you have managed file transfer, web forms, and so on. Uh, it's, it's impossible as a result to have a, a unified view into all of that, as well as to actually enact always on centralized monitoring of that content. Amit, uh, you know, can you talk a bit about all of these silos? Uh, you know, why is that why is that the case in the first place? But, but then how does this create a problem? Can you delve into more detail on you know how this prevents you from having centralized visibility as well as being able to uh, monitor things centrally in an ongoing manner? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when you have siloed tools uh, in the organization, uh, it creates a huge effort. You need to basically define and enforce the policy for each and every tool separately. If you do that, it increases the potential for human error. You can misconfigure or even sometimes miss a tool. Uh, some, some organizations have many, many of them, and, you know, you didn't update one of them. You didn't uh, put the right policy in one of them, and you're exposed. Uh, you know, there are, by definition, there are many more entry points for the attackers if you have many tools. So it increases the, the surface area for attacks. Um, you need to maintain security updates over all of them, uh, make sure that they're all up to date. And like you said, you, you, you have, uh, you're lacking a central oversight. Uh, the, the SecOps and compliant teams uh, need to look at each and every tool separately, look at the logs, try to unify them right, to, to make sense of, of the mess. And it's really, really challenging for organizations today uh, until we come with our solution. We don't have this slide in today's deck, but we do have a slide that we use here at KiteWorks frequently that has like this big hairball of all this stuff, that, and it's impossible to untangle it. And I think it's a, it's a good analogy because that's exactly what happens with all these different silos is they result in a hairball that you can never fully untangle and where you can't even see through it because it lacks the the visibility you require. Um, all right, well, we uh, spoke about this a little bit already, both Dan and Amit did, uh, in terms of what that potential risk looks like. It's just not, uh, you know, financial repercussions or it's lost IP or damaged brand F uh, reputation, or the fines and penalties, the system downtime. Uh, you know, you can go on and on. There's a lot of different dynamics that are involved here when it comes to what potential risk looks like. Uh, most of us probably uh, keep our tabs on the IBM Poneman uh, Institute annual report on the cost of uh, a data breach. It keeps going up. It goes up every year. I don't think it's ever gone down one year. Uh, in the U.S., it's actually exponentially higher than the number here. This is a worldwide number of 4.35 million. Uh, I think it's at over $9 million now in the U.S. alone in terms of the overall cost when you begin to add up all these different components. So the financial risk that's associated with an actual data breach, uh, specifically related to sensitive content, is, is substantial uh, for an organization. And some of these elements are things that lurk be below the surface that you may not even fully realize until you go through a breach, and then you understand the implications of all the legal fees and the court issues, as well as the, the penalties and fines that just seem to never stop or end as they keep coming in. Uh, so let's dive into a little more detail on, uh, I broke these up into six areas, as we just saw on that previous slide. Uh, legal fees and compliance, the cost of notifying customers of a breach. Uh, you know, you have your paperwork, you got to you know, get your law, law, lawyers involved. It increased this past year 30%, from 23% to 30%. Insurance premiums increased 79%. Insur you know, getting cybersecurity insurance is 
becoming more and more difficult uh, and, and insurance that actually covers a breach, right? You can get insurance, but it may not really pay a whole lot. It may not be worth the money that you're paying for now because of the rates uh, and the fact that uh, insurance organizations are having a really difficult time assessing the, the risk that the cyber breach might pose to an organization that's coming to them and asking them for insurance. Dan, let's start with you here. I think this is a this is a good one. There's a lot of attention paid to fines and penalties, brand reputation damage, but is that really the biggest risk when it comes to uh, you know uh, sensitive content when it's breached? Yeah, that, that that's a great question. Um, I think it is an important aspect, but I think there are kind of many more dimensions now that we're starting to see come in. Um, you know, we, we would think about it now, we're seeing so much around uh, ransomware extortion, you know, the whole IP issue, uh, system downtime, and, it, and it's probably worth, Patrick, even delving into these areas in a little bit more detail. But um, yeah, an important part of it, but not the whole story anymore. Yeah, I think you're spot on there. Amit, uh, let's go over to you on this one. Stolen IP between 50 and 85% of a company's worth is in its IP. That's huge when you think about it. Uh, and a lot of this is floating around out there. It's not protected. It's not encrypted. Uh, the U.S. alone, uh, this, this came from this federal government, uh, pinpoints uh, the annual loss at $600 billion for the U.S. alone when it comes to uh, IP that, that is stolen. Um, you know, what we, we see geopolitical combatants is one of the primary causes here, but are they the only ones? Definitely not. Well, and as you know, I'm coming from there, but there are many other, uh, and you know, to name a few, uh, we, we see hostile commercial competition you know, in many countries. It's totally fine, sometimes even encouraged to steal IP from a Western based company. Uh, give you an example, we have a customer, a big toys manufacturer, they, are, they share the concern that uh, their competitors would steal the IP and go to market before they do. Basically manufacture all the toys before they have the chance to get to market. That's an, one example. Another is the insider threats. It could be a, an employee, uh, maybe he's living for a competitor, or maybe just a mis by mistake share some IP outside of the organization. And of course, uh, uh, to Dan's point, uh, the criminal threat actors, you know, on, on ransomware, it's one thing when they lock you out of your email, it's a total different ball game if they gain access to your core competitive advantage. Yep, yep, you're absolutely right there. Um, Dan, let's go back to, to you. Uh, extortion, you spoke about ransomware al already. Extortion, sort of the, the Uber category and ransomware fits underneath that. Um, you know, it doesn't, it seems like it doesn't matter what you read, right? You read uh, uh, Manniot's report, you read Verizon's report, you read IBM's report, your Unit 42's report, uh, something from Palo Alto Networks. They all pinpoint ransomware at the very top of the list. Why, why is ransomware, you know, why does it pose such a risk? And, and number two, what, probably because it poses such a risk, the cyber criminals are, are turning to it more and more often. Yeah, I mean, ransomware is certainly the flavor of the month, if you like. It's the hot way of making money through cybercrime, really. Um, and I think that's because it's relatively easy to deploy. The attacker just needs to run a little bit of their code on your machine. And they can do that really um, over time and do that very slowly and carefully. But once that's done, they're on the inside right, and then you're in trouble. And we talked about how they can easily then capture your workstation and then go on to get your network. And having got themselves in that position where they have control over your um, world, as it were, they can launch the hammer blow, encrypting your data. Perhaps they might you know, take a cut of your um, sensitive data, a copy of that to show you later. But... Um, and it's so effective, Patrick, because it is um, the initial stages that are very, very hard to detect. And it only gets noticed when it's when it's all too late. And and this is the point that I think everybody is getting to now where they realize that um, it's so important to stop that first point of ingress. You know, gone are the days where, you know, we'll work it out later if they get in. No, you've really got to stop that initial point of ingress and then, you know, you have a chance then. But yeah, certainly flavor of the month. 
Hmm. On the, the CDR capabilities that we're going to talk about a little later from uh, Force Point, enable you to do that, right? You don't want to be reactive. You want to be proactive. And that's what uh, the solution allows you to do. Uh, and, you know, the concept of zero trust implies that in many ways, right? Yeah, you just can't let it in. Yeah. Uh, Amit, uh, brand reputation, um, you know, there's, there's a data point I have here, you know, shareholders lose an average of 26% of value during a post-crisis year. The year after the actual breach, you lose 20%, 26% of the company's value. That, that's big when you think about it. PII data seems to be, you know, uh, a key focus area for cyber attacks. Not always, but many times. Uh, and that really impacts brand reputation. Why, why is that the case? You know, take take UOI uh, for example. You know, if if you know that your data has been breached, you're already concerned. You already take actions to protect it, and you probably won't continue to be a customer of of that company uh, unless they somehow convince you 100 percent that they fixed and it would never ever happen again. Uh, you know, if they stole your PII, they can uh, uh, open a mortgage under your own name. They can go shopping with your credit card. You, you want to stay a customer of the of that company, and that leads to, to a, a decrease uh, sales volume, churn of customers, and of course the uh, the uh, valuation hit that you mentioned. Uh, you know, we, we have the the uh, Target, we have the T-Mobile. Every every uh, few months, there there is a big hack on PII where you see the valuation drops significantly. So absolutely a, a major uh, uh, factor. Yeah, when they hack PII, it's just not the intellectual property of the company or systems that go down that affect uh, you know thousands or or maybe even millions of users for a period of time. It it actually has long term repercussions to consumers who are out in the marketplace because you're talking about PII. So I think that's one of the reasons why when someone has PII data hacked, it has maybe a a bigger impact on a company's brand reputation than some of these other. Uh, issues where other types of content is actually stolen or hacked. Dan, on this next one, you know, I had a client that's been probably six or seven years ago as a manufacturer, and I wrote a study on them. They were hacked, had a ransomware attack. Uh, you know, they're a furniture manufacturer. So you think furniture manufacturer, I think is out of China. Why do they care about it? Well, they actually shut their systems down and they, they got ransom as a result of it, but they also got access to their system that suddenly six months after the fact, the same furniture designs to Meat's point a moment ago, the toy manufacturer started popping up with some of their competitors in China, right? It was stolen intellectual property. So, you know, system downtime might be one of the uh, reasons for a hack, but it may have other repercussions or other intents as well. Can, can you talk a bit about, it? I mean, the, the system downtime numbers here are huge when you think about it, you know, anywhere between, you know, $926 to $17,000 per minute, depending on the company, right? Uh, and downtime is associated with 23% of cyber attacks today. Yeah, and, and interestingly, I think this aspect is, is growing, um, but not in a good way, as, as it were. We have um, a really interesting example in the United Kingdom right now with um, the Royal Mail, their international parcels business. And it's an ongoing situation. They've been really debilitated um, by ransomware that, that got to them, but it's brought them down and, and, and almost sort of ransomware equals downtime now. Mm. Um, but these guys are talking significant amounts of money through not being able to operate. You know, customers, loyal customers have gone elsewhere and their international um, business, their parcel business is, is just non-existent. They're talking of hundreds of millions of dollars of, of disruption, if you like. So I, I think this particular dimension is is one that will grow and become more prevalent and, and difficult for companies to to get their heads around. Hmm. Hmm. Very interesting. It, it's something that organizations don't think of think about as much, right? And it's just not the only reason for an attack, um, and it has long lasting implications. Speaking about long lasting implications, you know, there's all these new regulations that keep popping up, particularly on the data privacy front, but not only on the data privacy front, we have others obviously that are maturating, uh, being changed. There's updates to them. There's actually new regulations. Uh, we're gonna talk a bit about those in a, in a bit. 
but the penalties associated with an actual breach of your private data can be substantial, particularly if it's related to PII or PHI data. Uh, Amit, can you talk a bit about these? And organizations don't always understand the full repercussions of fines and penalties and you know the need to get lawyers involved and so forth until they actually go through a breach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we discussed already a few examples. Uh, the fines and 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 penalties could be critical and significant. It could be millions, tens of millions, even in some cases, uh, especially in the healthcare industry, uh, where you see exposure to and, and violation of HIPAA regulations. You'll see millions of millions of dollars in fines. Let alone the the class action lawsuits that come together with it and the legal fees that we already discussed. So. Absolutely uh, significant and critical. Well, thanks to both of you for reviewing each of these. Uh, we could add more to the list, but you know the, the financial risk break down into basically six six categories here, and uh, organizations need to realize that it's just not one, but it's all of the different risks that they need to be concerned about when it comes to their private data. And speaking about private data, we got some interesting research here that we'd like to share with you. Uh, this is from Gartner. Eighty four percent of businesses indicate data privacy is the most valuable factor for them when they buy software. Uh, above everything else, 84%, that's a huge number when you think about it. Uh, so take that into consideration. And the next item here, the next data point, uh, I think it's from the same Gardner report, 75% of the world's population will have PII covered under modern privacy regulations by next year. So it's not something you can ignore. Uh, wherever you're at in the world, you got to be concerned about uh, PII data. If you aren't protecting that data and you're not compliant with the regulations out there, you're going to be fine. And you're going to have some of the repercussions we we just talked about. Um, let's uh, take a look at the two more elements. If I can get my slide to build here, you can see the different data privacy. This is just a few. There's a lot more, obviously, that are out there. Uh, some of the ones that many in our audience may be struggling to address within their own organizations. And then... You know, if we didn't have enough, there's four more coming. Uh, individual states in the U.S. are passing their own data privacy regulations. Uh, one or two of these are already in effect, and I believe the last one goes in, uh, is implemented at the end of the year. Uh, so the landscape continues to evolve, and the implications of an actual uh, uh, breach or exposure of uh, your private data becomes uh, greater and greater over time. I mean, let's start with you here. Exposure of PII, and you spoke about this a, a bit already. You know, it can pose serious risk to an organization. Uh, how is it becoming increasingly more difficult for organizations to, to ensure that they're adhering with these regulations in the marketplace? Yeah, there, there are several factors that made it uh, much more complex and difficult. Uh, to touch on a few, uh, there, are, there is the growing number of data sources and applications. Nowadays, an organization can have hundreds or thousands of external parties to communicate with. And each, each of them can use dozens of different applications, tools, uh, uh, you know, cloud, on-prem, many, many different uh, data sources and applications here. Uh, I'm not talking about only human beings. It can also be uh, systems like the CRM would send a, a, a file or NetSuite or, you know, in specific industry-specific uh, examples like electronic medical records. So there are many more uh, uh, to deal with. Uh, the second is that we discussed it a little bit. The, the uh, threat actors are more sophisticated. Now the, there is a fine line. The difference between nation state and criminals became very small. Sometimes it's the, the very same people, and yeah. uh, ransomware became an industry. Uh, so you know it's much more uh, difficult to deal with. On the other hand. Uh, there are many uh, more bad actors involved. Now every kid with computer and, uh, and internet connection can become a hacker. And uh, with chat GPT, they don't even have to learn how to code. So, you know, many more actors uh, involved. And, uh, and lastly, many organizations still have uh, legacy systems in place. Uh, big organizations and also not so big, uh, sometimes uh, find it difficult uh, to cope with modernization of their IT environment. Uh, you can have a state-of-the-art email uh, security, but you have a, an MFT system from the 90s. So, you know, uh, maintaining all of them up to date, uh, uh, patching them if, if it 
if it's possible at all, uh, it's really challenging for organizations. Yeah, certainly. So that's that's an interesting overview. Dan, on this last item, these four new uh, state regulations, I thought I would leave it to uh, uh, you know, someone from uh, across the pond over <laughs> in Great Britain to answer this question. <laughs> but, you know, these U.S. states that are passing the regulations, right, we, we can't do it the easy way and pass one at the federal level. We're trying. Maybe we'll get there eventually. Uh, so instead, we're going to have siloed, disparate state regulations that are similar but dissimilar in nature, of course, that are going to be passed over the next couple of years for this year. And uh, there's actually a number of states that are trying to push through comparable uh, data privacy laws. You know, what, what do these mean? You know, what, for, for an organization that's doing business in Virginia or Utah or Colorado or Connecticut uh, this year, uh, what do they need to think about when it comes to these new uh, privacy laws that have been enacted? Yeah, I mean, um, it's not an unhealthy situation. And personal opinion, I think there's so much interest in in um, states getting involved in it and um, and interested in policing this situation because of the rise of ransomware, actually. So bad guys are typically interested in personal data for nefarious um, kind of issues around ransomware. But personal data has its own intrinsic value to the bad guys. Uh, um, Amit touched on one earlier where you set up fraudulent accounts, for example, you know, applying for a mortgage in somebody else's name or whatever. Um, but the point is, and the level of interest is, personal data is a target. And if the bad guys succeed, then the regulators and these states that are bringing in the, uh, the new regulations would rightly be very, very interested in why you as an organization didn't take the right steps to protect that data in, on your system. So um, I think the level of interest from them, I mean, I, I, I know you're teasing me about the, um, it'd be <laughs> nice to have one federal one, but, you know, it still shows the level of rigor that we have to put in these days to to defend our organizationals, um, you know, personal data in a, in, a, in a really proper way. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot to think about there. We actually have a webinar in another week. I have two lawyers, <laughs> general counsels, <laughs> who are getting together with me, and we're going to talk about the data privacy. So this obviously will be one of the questions that I pose to them. I'm curious to uh, hear what the response is. Uh, let's jump to our next slide. So our audience may be asking, okay, you define the problem. We understand what the dimensions look like. We're concerned. What do we do? Uh, KiteWorks and Forcepoint have put together four uh, recommendations uh, that are related to our actual integration strategy. So let's jump through these four. Uh, the first one here, Dan, let's start with you. You know, assumes all entities are untrusted by default, including this is what we had from a, a content defined zero trust standpoint, including the content itself. You know, why is this important? Yeah. So this was some of the ethos really behind that zero trust approach to, to content in the first place. Um, and just because you trust a person or an organization that's sending you some data, you really can't go the extra leap and trust the data. And this is because the sender might not be who they claim to be. The sender may have been compromised. You know, we talked about this extensively earlier on. Um, and that data is really from an attacker, you know, a supply chain attack. You mentioned it, um, Patrick, earlier on. Or a person, um, you know, God forbid, in your organization that um, has, has turned rogue. You know, um, they're an insider, a bad actor, as it were. So you have to assume there is no other stance to take um, to assume that all data that is coming your way is unsafe and you've got to take steps to control it. If you don't, an attacker will use it as a way to get in. Well, and that was the concept of the company you founded with the CDR and Zero Trust, that you just can't trust any content. You have, you have to assume that everything could be uh, malicious in, in nature. Yeah. Amit, uh, let's have you... Tackle the second one here. Uh, you got to enforce least privileged content access. What what does this mean? This is sort of related to what Dan talked about, but it's more expansive than that. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there are there are key main steps to to uh, enforce that, uh, and I'm talking best practice, which we actually uh, uh, allow and enable. And so first, you need to uh, uh, centrally define and configure policies. If you do that, uh, you define asset classes, appropriate policies, roles, groups, and then you review and update them regularly. Um, then you need to have the monitoring in place. Uh, and for, to do that, you have to have the logs and reporting and better to have them across all communication channels, regardless of the application, the source, or the destination of the, of the information. And obviously, lastly, you have the enforcement, or enforcement piece where you apply the policies in real time across the organization, again, uh, uh, regardless of any channel or, or, or uh, way that uh, the information is being shared with uh, in, in a consolidated way uh, in a single pane of glass. A lot of check boxes that you got to have checked off, which we're going to talk about how the private content network in concert with Forcepoint actually accomplishes that in a slide that's coming up. Uh, so I won't steal your thunder yet on that sub subject. Uh, Dan, let's switch this one back to you. DLP, you know, real, it has to be real time in order to be effective. It has to be integrated with uh, your, your policy management, your tracking and your controls. Uh, you know, what does it mean to have real time tracking and control when it comes to data loss prevention? Yeah, so so you need those controls in place, right? You know, we've talked about exactly the dimensions, why you need to do that. But data loss prevention, you have to be in a situation where you can actually use a security control like DLP to drive productivity. Ultimately, it's a business. You know, um, we've seen it in the past where fatigue, you know, security fatigue gets in the way and people don't use the right controls in place. But the wonderful thing about the force point data loss prevention is it can do this in the real time and drive very high productivity, but at the same time being able to adapt and adjust to any kind of risky behaviors that a user might be trying. So we don't have to paint it all with one more draconian, one size fits all, as it were. So it's it's really neat um, and it's appropriate, but you've got to be able to have the controls in place, but at the same time, be able to drive productivity in the business. Interesting. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I've you know, spent a decade at Symantec. We had a DLP solution and the adoption rates were difficult for some of the same reasons that you just described it. That real-time yeah. element is really a requisite. I mean, the last element here is, you know, we alluded to this uh, on a couple earlier slides, but, you know, always on monitoring. What, you know, what does this look like? Yeah, it's the always on and the comprehensive. So, you know, the comprehensive piece is, is important as well because we allow it uh, across each and every file at the file level. Uh, and that's very important. There's no file that can, can be missed with our joint solution. And it doesn't matter if it's in transit or at rest uh, and where it goes, uh, it's always on. Uh, and like I mentioned before, it's a, on a single dashboard, we call it a CISO dashboard. Uh, you, you enable the, the SOC team to identify and respond to threats and violations in real time. So you always monitor uh, the, the data and the content in the organization and you can stop or, or act accordingly if you see something that is unusual. And that CISO dashboard, uh, I think this may be on one of the subsequent slides. So I'll let you answer this question now. I mean, it's actually integrated or it can be integrated into your SOC, into your SIM as well. So you don't need to look at a CISO dashboard and your SIM. You actually can get it integrated so you have one, one spot, one platform that you use for that purpose. Exactly. No. Perfect. All right. Uh, the question is, who am I going to pick on for this particular slide uh, that looks at the solution from a holistic standpoint? There's a lot going on here, to my point. Uh, I'm being conscious of time. I mean, let's have you explain this one to our audience. It, it's the private content network in conjunction with the force point, uh, zero trust CDR and the DLP solution. You know, So how does all this work? What are we looking at here? Yeah, so I'll touch it on high level because we'll, we'll dive deeper in the, in the next few slides, but... If you look left to right, you look at the inbound uh, content, uh, you get a someone or a system uh, that sends uh, information into the organization. They can use any of the communication channels. And once they use it, 
It's already in the private quantum network, the PCN, what we called it. Uh, it's already in. Then from there, we uh, uh, the PCN routes the, the content through the CDR. Everything can be routed. Nothing is missed. Everything is checked. Everything is, is, uh, deconstruct is, is uh, uh, treated by the CDR. And, uh, and Dan can talk about the magic that is happening there. And then after it comes uh, reconstructed and clean, it comes, back, it comes to the destination. It could be an employee. Uh, it could be also a system, system of record or another system in the organization. Uh, and everything is being tracked. Everything is being documented. You have a full audit trail across all the activities along the, this uh, route. And it's the same uh, on the outbound. Uh, if, a, if the organization wants to share information, it first, the, 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 the PCN ensures that everything goes to the DLP. From the DLP, we get a decision. And based on the decision, the PCN routes it either outside or block it or take another action based on the recommendation from the DLP uh, using a, a, a central policy across all the communication, across all the files. You don't need to do it uh, once for every different tool like we discussed. Very powerful uh, joint solution, I believe. Dan, I'm going to uh, wait to ask you about the force point components because we have a couple more detailed slides here in a moment, and I'll let you delve sure. into detail for with our audience on those. Uh, but before we do so, uh, Amit, you know, the you, we have the private content network on that prior slide, but this is a deeper dive that looks at you know how we unify sensitive content communications, how we track everything, how we control everything through uh, centralized policy management, and then how we actually secure it. You know, at a high level, you know, how does this all work for our audience? This is a, obviously another eye chart, but uh, it's important to understand. Yeah, and, and many details on the slide. Uh, I won't cover everything, but you know, on the left side, you can see the different sources. Again, it could be systems. It could be individuals. Uh, they can use each and every uh, communication channel, and the KiteWorks PCN unified them all. Uh, that allows you to then track everything uh, on a full audit trail, uh, across everything um, and have the controls. And the controls are in real time. You can, uh, you can have a policy-driven uh, rights management. Uh, so you treat different content differently, depends on me the metadata, depends on, on other attributes of the data. Uh, for example, if you send, uh, if, uh, if an, a content is not allowed to be open in China, you block it, uh, as simple as that. And the security level is also important. We double encrypt uh, both at rest and in motion. Uh, the tunnel is encrypted and the file is encrypted. So if somebody breaks into the tunnel, the file is still encrypted. And the, uh, the encryption keys are stayed with the customer. So we don't have access to the content of the customer whatsoever. The, the final thing I want to highlight is that we, uh, we have a single tenant hosting, so you don't, share a ten, you don't share your tenant with others. Nobody can buy a, an instance on your own tenant and break uh, through. Uh, very powerful, very secure. That's great. Yeah, a lot going on on this slide. Uh, some of our audience may want to take a screenshot, or we obviously can share that with you if you ask uh, for uh, a copy of the slides via chat. So. Uh, Really important stuff. Uh, Dan, uh, so when you look at Force Point Zero Trust CDR, we have this high level overview here, and then we have a subsequent slide that looks at the integration with uh, the private content network. Talk a bit about this slide. You know, how, what makes Force Point Zero Trust CDR unique in the marketplace? Yeah. So we take in a three stage approach to the problem. Um, the first stage, the extraction phases, if you like. We extract the um, valuable business data from that content and we make a model of that, which describes what's in it. We then put it through a verification stage, the second stage of the pro process, which really checks the model. It checks the model is safe and doesn't contain anything that you don't want in there. And if it goes through that verification stage, we move on to the build stage where we take the model and we build brand new data that reflects exactly what we described. The important piece here is none of the original data gets delivered. Uh, and this is unlike other traditional CDR solutions, which remove code, known code anyway, 
um, but can leave um, other data in place to be delivered, the original data, which isn't as thorough. So that's how we that's how we do it, Patrick. Interesting, interesting. Now this slide uh, delves into detail in terms of how it works in concert with the private content network. Um, if, Dan, let's stay with you on this one. You know, how does yeah. uh, the private content network amplify uh, the value proposition that your customers get with uh, Force Point Zero Trust CDR? Yeah, and, and we like this integration a lot. So the Zero Trust CDR makes all data safe, right? But it's only effective if it fits seamlessly into the business. You know, if, if users have to call it up or it's it's tricky, it ain't going to get used and it isn't going to get the protection. You know, organizations won't receive the protection they deserve. But here, um, when it's integrated in the KiteWorks uh, platform, users don't even know it's happening. It's seamless and it's so slick. Um, I've got to tell you, this is one of the most impressive integrations of our technology in any platform. This is really neat um, and it should be invisible to users, which it is, which is fantastic. Oh, we love to hear that. That's that's a quote. <laughs> we really yeah. appreciate your comment there. Uh, I mean, you know, Force Point Zero Trust CDR also augments, uh, you know, our private content network. It, it, it helps extend that uh, protection one more mile to the content layer. Can you speak to how that happens? Yeah, absolutely. So like I mentioned, we uh, at KiteWorks, we don't look at the content at all. And we don't, uh, we have an antivirus embedded, but it's not as powerful as, as what the CDR is offering. So by by routing everything to the CDR, um, we, we gain that additional layer of security across all the content that's coming into the organization. Very powerful. We love this integration as well. I think it's a huge win-win for us, for fourth point, but also for the customer, which is the most important. Dan, we hear a lot about antivirus, uh, you know, and we have antivirus built into the KiteWorks platform, and that's critically important, obviously. Um, but for customers out in the marketplace, they say, you know, they maybe listen to this. Well, we have antivirus. Uh, why do we need CDR? What, what's your response to them? Um, it gives you that extra rigor. It's a high assurance solution, and it's really the approach that's quite unique. So it doesn't cost you anything in terms of um, time or anything. And indeed, because we're always using the same process, it's very quick, very thorough, and the efficacy is just off the chart. So, um, you know, a AV has its place. It's useful in certain places. Uh, absolutely, it is. Um, but we like what we've done. If you are really got to put some rigor in there and can't afford any mistakes, this is how you do it. Zero trust CDR. Makes a lot of sense. So let's take a look at uh, Force Point DLP. Uh, you talked about how you know it's, it's in real time. You also have this terminology called risk adaptive DLP. Uh, you know, talk a bit about, you know, what that means and how it works. There's a lot on this slide, obviously. We had to replicate this in the uh, KiteWorks uh, template, and uh, it took us some doing to, to get it over from the fourth point template <laughs> into ours. Uh, talk a bit about these different elements. There's, you know, this is a really useful slide here if, if you look at the detail. Yeah, so, so Force Point has a huge provenance in data loss prevention. Um, you know, I, I smiled earlier when you reminded me of Symantec, who were a great competitor years ago, um, but we've moved on. And the experience we have in this place has allowed us to be um, very progressive in our thinking to, to use this kind of risk adaption where you drive productivity. We talked about this earlier. Businesses need something that doesn't get in the way of them. So it drives productivity. You still have the protection um, related specifically to your business, but you do have the ability to, to work fast. It allows you to go fast because you can pick out those riskier um, user behaviors that, that you do want to block. So it's, it's, it's been um, something um, that's really served us well in the marketplace, and we're very proud of this capability. 
And then the just the chart here that you know walks you through the step of you know actually something taking place. Can you can you talk a bit about you know how you go from a 24, you know, you're down low risk, but then suddenly you're at a 95 and critical risk? Yeah. And and I always kind of think, you know, there are there's stuff that goes on. There are people that are deliberately maybe bad actors doing stuff, but there are also um you know, the vast majority of staff want to do the right thing. So you've got to protect them automatically and protect them almost from doing something unwittingly. So once you've got your policies in place, and we have one of the most extensive preset policy um, libraries that people can use automatically out of the box, um, you have the ability just to put those behaviors that are going to risk your particular business in a way that you don't want and you are able to kind of score them and 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 then uh, react as it were to those scoring so the higher the risk um, depicted here on the chart in red you know we, we could, we're likely to going to be blocking that um, or certainly doing things to it to 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 help um, ensure that the organization doesn't get itself into trouble interesting all right, well, let's take a look at what it looks like when it's integrated with the KiteWorks Private Content Network. I mean, let's uh, flip the conversation back to you for at least the start of this, this slide. A lot going on once again, but it fully depicts what the integration truly looks like. Uh, walk us through what this handshake between the PCN and Forcepoint DLP looks like. Yeah. Uh, so again, when an when internal party uh, wants to send something outside, uh, we, with the PCN, ensures that it goes to the DLP. So there's no route that is going around the DLP or anything like that. Uh, you, you gain that full, uh, the full, every, every data is going through the DLP. And, uh, once the, and you also use the centrally defined policy. So you, you define it once and it, it goes to the DLP. Uh, and it's being used uh, across the board with the joint solution, then the DLP gives us back the decision, what, what Dan basically uh, described before. And then the PCN can either pass it or, or don't pass it. If you don't pass, you give an alert in real time uh, to the SecOps or compliance team. Uh, and regardless if it pass or fail, you uh, document everything, every action of the file on the DLP, on PCN, you have that full audit trail that you can uh, see in real time, but also prove that you uh, that you comply with the regulation. Very powerful, and we hear all the many customers that really want it. It, it amplifies the uh, the security aspects, the protections that are built into the KaiWorks PCN. It just it makes them greater. D Dan, when you look at the uh, uh, Forcepoint DLP, you know what? How does uh, adding works amplify the impact, the positive impact that you have on customers. Yeah, very, very similar comments actually to the amplification of ZT, CDR as it were. So we are um, very excited again by this integration because as Amit says, you know, you get this just um, by being on the platform. So this happens in a seamless way and the decisions are very clear. You know, they're informed decisions, whether you allow or block something. But to the user, this is kind of invisible, um, which is exactly how you want uh, security controls generally to be. So, yeah, we're, we're delighted with the integration. It's worked well. No, that's great. Uh, it, it's a win-win scenario for joint customers of Forcepoint yeah. and KiteWorks to our conversation. Um, all right. Well, this is the last slide that I have uh, beyond uh, if we have a little time for one or two uh, Q&A questions that have come in here uh, that we're going to cover today. Uh, I have three elements. I, I like to talk in uh, groups of three. So uh, before we do so, I want to remind everyone that you can actually schedule a call with the uh, joint KiteWorks and Forcepoint teams by going to kiteworks.com slash demo. Uh, we'll set up time for you to speak with uh, the joint teams about uh, how these two components work together. We can answer uh, your detailed questions. We can actually create a, a custom tailored demo uh, for your environment if uh, you want us to do so. So uh, check us out. Make sure to request a, a meeting with us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. 
So the first element that I have on the slide here, I guess this one is mine, but when you talk about the, the prevalence of dark risk, when we go back to that financial risk uh, slide that we covered about 45 minutes ago, there's a lot of unrecognized or I would say unappreciated risk when it comes to uh, you know, your content layer. Uh, you think about, oh, I lost IP or I have a ransomware attack, I gotta pay for it. Well, you also have a bunch of legal fees and compliance answers. Uh, you got to show that you actually have made changes in your environment to ensure that it's been cleaned up. There's a lot of IT work that needs to take place and you have fines and penalties. A lot of those you just don't really fully appreciate until uh, you know a, a data breach of uh, sensitive content takes place. So that's one of the takeaways that I have from this conversation that our audience needs to factor into consideration when they are looking at their private content, their private data, uh, which is being exchanged between different systems, whether it's email uh, with third parties, uh, file sharing, managed file transfer, web forms, and, and so forth. You got to have the right controls, the right technologies in place. And we believe that uh, KiteWorks and ForcePoint have that. So that's the, the first takeaway that I had. Uh, Amit, this one is yours. Uh, governance needs to be based on cybersecurity standards. Yeah, so <clears throat> we covered how uh, gov governance is critical for compliance and security and, and how the, the policies are critical for that. Uh, and we've seen that siloed policies uh, are prone for errors. Um, I think the key takeaways that I, I would like uh, the audience to, to go with is that uh, our joint solution uh, solved that. We enable the central definition and, and enforcement of the policies. We give an easy tool for to view everything in a single dashboard and a straightforward way to prove that all the compliance requirements have been fully met. Yep, spot on. Dan, your takeaway, content-based zero trust. I'm, I'm sure our audience isn't surprised that zero trust is in, in your takeaway based on your background, but it must account for both inbound and outbound content. Ab absolutely. So it's important that you, we talked about how um, it's critical to keep that kind of first hit out. Um, you know, if you can stop that first point of ingress, you're in a good place. So inbound is is quite kind of, you know, yeah, we, we understand that well. Um, not so well understood, actually. We also need to clean the data um, on the way out. And this is because content formats are so complex there are lots of opportunities for a for a bad guy to to hide stuff covertly in content and many folk on the call today would be aware of steganography based attacks and the ability to exfiltrate um, so we clean on the way out as well and then give clean data for which other um, engines like the dlp capability can make informed decisions. So the inbound and outbound, absolutely crucial. What that does for Forcepoint and KiteWorks together is it gives us the most uh, comprehensive data loss prevention capability in the world of any secure transfer because um, we can address both the um, covert and overt aspects of exfiltration. So the combination is, is really powerful. And with more people um, transferring more content around, um, platforms, um, KiteWorks PCN is, is critical to be able to do that safely. No, that's a great summary. Uh, thanks, Dan. Thanks, thanks for me. Uh, all right, we have like a minute left here, of course. <laughs> that's usually the case with these webinars that I moderate as we go through a lot of valuable content. Uh, let's see if we have time to answer two quick questions here. I'm looking at questions that came in. Um, it, it, Dan, I think you already talked about this one, uh, pre-built policies that can be built, you know, used out of the box. You, you talked a bit about that, but here's another one that might be uh, more interesting. Is CDR intelligence shared with Kiteworks or other technology capabilities? Yeah. Um, so the zero trust approach to content um, disarm and reconstruction is not detection based in any way. So there isn't intelligence in the in the traditional way, but what you do have through logging and syslog, et cetera, is, is knowledge of what's happened, the process, if you like. Um, we call the overall process transformations. 
And you can often see your dashboards that will give you, you know, a 99.999 um, success rate of transformation. So um, you get intelligence that we can pass on to um, other platforms in that sense, but it's process intelligence, not threat intelligence per se in the, in the way that people would typically understand it, Patrick. That's, that's great. That's actually a great uh, question from our audience. So thanks for uh, chatting that in. Amit, uh, last question here, and then we'll have to wrap things up. Uh, and this actually is a really good question, I thought. Uh, I already have CDR installed in my organization. Can I still connect KiteWorks platform to it? Is that possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the integration allows for it, and all you need to do is to reach out to your uh, account manager and we'll make it happen. Perfect. Well, and everyone has that URL link. And make sure you uh, at request a demo request, a meeting with uh, the uh, joint KiteWorks and ForcePoint team, and uh, we'll obviously get that scheduled with you. We appreciate our audience. I know you have a lot of webinars to choose from. We, we're grateful for your attendance. Thank you for the great questions that you chatted in today. I would like to personally thank Dan for his time, as well as Amit. It was a great conversation, impressive integration. Uh, organizations around the world are going to benefit from this. So thanks today for your time, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. See you on our next webinar.